of our sermons, and I suspect this week will be one of the higher watched ones with as many people as home sick. Um, by the way, we are looking to uh, next year look into live streaming our service too, if that interests you. That's hopefully coming down the pipe. We're looking into that right now, but um, I'm curious to see how many people watch this week because. If you go back on our on our tape for the last uh, three years or so that we were recording sermons, uh, Chelsea's still got the number one watch sermon. And I keep checking that every once in a while to see if that changes. And she keeps not believing me, and I keep showing her and stuff. And probably the fact that I click on it to look on it adds another view. And so she, she wins that way. But uh, that's just a little fun competition. She always goes, really? Are you sure? And I go, yes, I'm sure. You're still number one. And it's like... I know. She will preach more, don't worry, but I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. I hope you got to spend fantastic time with family or friends and having uh, good food. I know we had a great time here last week. Uh, thank you to all that cooked all your, man, just wonderful tasting food. We had a, uh, I just was so full and just had, just so happy. Uh, it's just funny how that works and you eat a bunch of food and you just get so happy. And I hadn't even thought too much about the fact that this week kicks off Advent and really, that's terrible, because as a pastor, this should be something we should be planning for far in advance, because this is one of our two biggest seasons in the church. The first one is Advent, which is the season preparing our hearts for celebrating Jesus' arrival to this earth. And the other one is Lent, which comes before Easter, and that's the season preparing our hearts for the fact that He did not stay in that grave, did not stay on that cross, but was raised three days. Those two things give us the hope for everything. And maybe I'm spoiling the sermon by telling that ahead of time, but today we're talking about hope. And as we go through Advent, and by the way, Advent's not anything you'll find in the Bible. You can't find it in the New Testament where Jesus says, and, and after I'm gone, you will celebrate four weeks out of the year. Yeah, there's nothing like that. Advent is a church tradition, and we celebrate it with four topics, hope, peace, joy, and love. And those are the four we'll be looking at over the next four weeks. And today we're looking at hope. And we're going to be in probably an unusual spot in the Bible because most people will stay squarely in the book of Luke and the story of Jesus coming into this earth. And we'll be talking about that in a few weeks. But today we're going to be in John chapter 4, which is the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. And I'm going to read the whole account. It's all 42 verses, so bear with me. We're going to read that first to start, and then we're going to talk about hope and how it relates to that passage this morning. So bear with me if you'd like to follow along. We're in John chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 42. Here we go. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize him, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way, and eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sachar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift of God, the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this matter, mountain, or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know well and all about Him, for salvation comes through the Jews. 
But the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him this way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water, aside, water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone, the disciples asked each other? Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me, and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see Him, they begged Him to stay in their village, so He stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear His message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you have told us, but because we have heard him ourselves, now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Lord, I ask you to open up this passage to our hearts this morning as we look to this concept of hope, as we look to understand it and how it relates to you and how your coming this earth gives us all the hope that we need. Lord, will you bless us this morning in helping us to understand it and become closer to you by hearing your word this morning. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Brian spoke earlier about hope, and I really appreciate that he mentioned Star Wars too. Thanks, buddy. I, I can't tell you how much I... And that's what we celebrate today. So what is hope? I mean, it's a term we use every day. And I looked up the definition on dictionary.com, and it's kind of funny. I haven't done this in a couple years. It's the reason I haven't done this in a couple years is because I was taking some classes for my master's degree, and they specifically told you not to put dictionary definitions in a, a, a paper because it was not considered upper level. But sometimes I think when we're trying to understand concepts, we need to, I guess, start at that lower level, that basis of understanding, if you will. And I disagree with those instructors because I believe the way you should talk to somebody should always start at the same level and you can go up together from there. So dictionary.com says hope is this. The feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. It's also to look forward with desire and reasonable confidence. Or to believe, desire, or trust. That's the definition of the word hope. So how does that hit you this morning? Does that hit you as like, oh, I get it. That's, that's it. I've got hope. I know what hope is. Hope is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. I'm done. Sermon over. There's a lot more that goes into hope. Because hope can be a lot of different things in our lives. And as we look through this story, this passage this morning, hope runs like a roller coaster up and down. It's not consistent. It's not even consistently rising, although it does rise, but it really ebbs and flows. And let me put it to you this way. The first thing I would suggest to you this morning about hope, both in this story and in our lives, is this. Hope can be lost. Have you ever felt lost, like you didn't have any hope? Let's look at verse 9 and verses 19 through 20 again, because this is what it says. In verse 9... After Jesus has asked for a drink, it says this, The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And then if we skip over to verses 19 through 20, as the conversation continues, and Jesus has just told her that she's been married many times, living with a man she's not even married to, she says this, Sir, the woman said, You must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? The reason I would say here that hope can be lost, or hope is lost, is because for this woman at that point, 
she has no hope of having any kind of relationship at all with this stranger who she starts off by realizing he's some sort of teacher and then she started realizing he's some sort of prophet and he co she comes to realize in her life that he is the Messiah. But to start off the conversation, she has no hope, no expectation of any relationship between her and him because he is Jewish and she is Samaritan and this is a big problem. If you don't know why it's a big problem, I just want to share with you a little bit of the history of this because Samaria is, is a very interesting place. Jesus is going from Judea to Galilee. The shortest route is through Samaria. And he's taking the shortest route at this time. But typically, the Jewish people would not do that. They would go all the way around. And the reason they would go all the way around is this, is because it goes way back to a prophecy that we read last year in the book of Isaiah, if you remember that, about Assyria conquering Judah. When Assyria came in and conquered that area of Judah, they took over and they basically deported a lot of the Jewish people into custody. But they left some people there and then brought in a bunch of their own people. And what happened then is that after this mass deportation, and they took all these people they considered valuable, by, by the way, they left the people they didn't consider valuable. After this mass deportation, they brought in colonists, and these colonists intermixed with the Jewish people and basically started what becomes the Samaritan people. And not only that, they took their own religion and what little of the Jewish people there and kind of mixed the religion and kind of had this muddled religion. And so this is a big problem because later on when the Jews were able to resettle the year, the year, years later, this bitterness developed because as soon as they came in, they were dealing with these people who they considered mixed. And they didn't like that. If you were a Jewish person and you wanted to go worship in the temple, it had to be all Jewish people there. It couldn't be anybody who was Gentile also. And these people didn't worship the same God. They had this kind of collaboration of ideas that came together. And so these two groups did not get along at all. Their religion was different. Their overall ethnicity was different, although shared some things. And they didn't like each other at all. And the relationship just got more and more strained to where they would go out of their way to stay away from those Samaritan people. They each had a different place to worship God. The Jews did in Jerusalem. Right there is where the Samaritans did it on that Mount Gerizim place. For this woman sitting there at the well with Jesus coming up and asking her for a drink of water, she had no hope that they could have any kind of relationship at all. She had no hope at all because not only does she tell us how they're different people, but they worship differently, and there's no hope at all there. She, the hope is basically lost. And here's the scoop. It's not just lost for her relationship with this Jewish man walking up. I would imagine that a lot of hope is lost in her own personal life as well. We get a glimpse of that on a couple of passages. If we look at verses 16 through 18, we really get the eye-opening thing to really unravel more about this woman's life. Because Jesus makes this comment to her. He says, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. This is a big deal then. Not as big a deal in our, our day and age, but back then was a very, very big deal. And Jesus calls her out on it because she kind of says, well, I don't have a husband. Well, he goes, you had five husbands. We don't know what happened to those five husbands. We don't know if they all lived good lives and died for some strange reason. We don't know if they left her. We don't know what happened to them at all. We do know that at the moment she's living with a man who's not her husband. And we do know that she's at a well by herself in the middle of the day with no one else there to help her out or protect her. Let me tell you, if you're in a very desert place that has not a lot of water and you have to go to a place to get water, noontime is the worst time. It's very hot. It's very dry. The sun is beating down upon you. A lot of your water is going to evaporate on the way back. Noontime is the worst time to go and draw water. The best time is to go when it's cool in the morning before the day begins, which is where you would expect the majority of the Samaritan women to go. But we can kind of infer from the passage that she's not really accepted in with the other Samaritan women because she's living with a man she's not even married to. She's had five husbands before. She's an outcast. So she goes and gets her water at noontime in the middle of the day when it's terrible with no other protection, no other people to help her out. See, there's a lot of hope lost for this woman. There's hope lost for relationships. There's hope lost in her own personal life. 
I mean, how much hope can you have for your sixth marriage or even wanting to get married again for a sixth time if the other five have not worked out before? See, sometimes in our lives, hope gets lost. Maybe you feel like the woman at the well this morning. Maybe in your life, you feel like hope is lost for relationships with others or personal relationships that are deeper to you. The good thing about this story is it may start with a woman whose hope is lost, but it doesn't end there. Because, see, this neat thing happens that we catch a, a glimpse of that we didn't even realize could hope could have there is that this. Hope can hang on by a thread. Think about that for a second. You ever been in a point in your life where you feel like all hope is lost? You ever been in a point in your life, maybe now, where hope is just hanging on by a thread? It still is for her. It's not 100% lost because she makes this statement when Jesus starts explaining some things to her. He starts to tell her about what true worship is because she, she asks him this question, why do you guys worship in Jerusalem when we worship here? She's kind of really trying to distract the conversation. She doesn't want to address the fact the husband issue with him. So she goes right into another issue they have. He explains to her what it means about true worship and stuff. And then it says... In verse 25, her response to him is this. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. See, even though she doesn't have any reasonable expectation to have a relationship with Jesus or be able to talk with him, worship with him, there's just this little thread of hope that says someday this Messiah will come and he's going to make everything right and he's going to explain everything to us and it won't be so confusing anymore and we won't have arguments and disagreements and in this moment, we get a glimpse of the fact that there's hope hanging on by a thread. And that's a really good thing. She has just enough hope, just enough, to believe that the Messiah is still coming. You know, even the disciples felt this way at times. A lot of times we think of disciples and think, oh, they walked around with Jesus for three years. They were constantly fed by his teaching. They knew exactly what was going on. They were going out and healing people. But at times the disciples hit some low points themselves where it seemed like hope was lost. When Jesus was taken away and crucified, for all the disciples, hope seemed to be lost at that point. But then when he reappeared to them, things started to really change, except for one named Thomas. Because when Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't with them. And this was a problem because Thomas said, I saw him die on that cross. I know he's dead. I really felt like hope was lost. But I'll tell you what, there's only a thread left of hope left in my life. If I could only see this Jesus again, then I would have hope again. Maybe you remember the story. It's in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. It's where we get the whole concept of doubting Thomas. This is the story if you haven't heard it before. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers in them, and place my hand in the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before... Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. And Jesus told them, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's an example of someone who's got hope hanging on by a thread. All his friends are telling him that Jesus has risen from the dead and he's sitting there going, I want to believe it, but there's only a little bit of glimmer left in me that hopes that that could be true. And so I'll put this crazy precursor down. If I see it, I'll believe it. And Thomas is like, way off the hook. I want to stick my fingers in the holes in his hands and hand in his side. That is so gross. I'm never going to get over that. I, I just don't think that's what you really want to do. <laughs> but he says, if I see it, I'll believe it. For him, hope was just hanging on by a thread. Much like the woman at the well who says, when the Messiah comes, he's going to explain everything to us. He's going to make it all right. I have this little bit of hope left. Just a little bit. Maybe you find yourself in that same scenario this morning where your hope is just hanging on by a thread. That whatever life circumstances are that are at you is that hope's not completely gone, but it's just a little bit there. Just a little bit there. 
Well, for the Samaritan woman, things start to change after this conversation with Jesus because of this, this truth. Hope can be rekindled. Hope can be rekindled. There's no reason why hope can't be rekindled. And we see it happen in her life because right after she makes her declaration that the Messiah is coming and he will explain all things, she hears this incredible news in verse 26 through 30. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Remember this verse, church. Remember this verse because if someone ever tells you, I don't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, you can point to this and say, really? Then why would he declare himself to be the, the Messiah? That's the only way it could be. This is one of the several key verses where Jesus identifies himself as God in the flesh. And he says to her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. In that moment, her hope that was hanging on by a thread, waiting for that Messiah, all of a sudden it's rekindled because the hope of the Messiah coming is now in front of her, right in front of her very face, and has declared himself to be the Messiah. And she goes running to tell everyone she knows, you guys gotta see this. You guys gotta come and see and, and hear what, what this guy said and who this guy is. It's no longer this conversation about, well, when the Messiah comes, it's the Messiah is here. You guys have got to see. Can you imagine the excitement in her voice as she's going through the crowd and her town telling everyone to come see? This is a woman who's off on her own in the middle of the day getting water because she probably doesn't like to be around with the crowd because the crowd probably doesn't like her very much and is uncomfortable with her. And now she's going to everyone, it says, to let them know that they need to come and see. And her hope is rekindled. It is on fire. Sometimes as a church, we need to rekindle our hope. Sometimes we get so used to doing church and doing the Christian life that we start to forget about why we do the things we do. We start to forget about the hope of what we have. And it's not just our church that's happened to. One of the very first churches had that same problem. So much so that in the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks right to that church themselves. If you never read the book of Revelation, read it. It's a great read. Don't read it right before bed. You won't sleep. But read the book of Revelation sometime and you will find out in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus begins to speak to the churches and address them each. And in Revelation chapter 3, the verse 3 verses, he talks to the church in Sardis. This is what it says. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. This is Jesus speaking. I know all the things you do and you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you have heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. These are scary words. For those that were in the church of Sardis at the time, this should have been terrifying to them that Jesus was saying, you need to wake up. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. But that's not the end of the story. Because he doesn't just write him off and say, I'm done with you. Judgment is coming. He says, wake up. Strengthen for what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. He says, go back and heard and to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. He says, you can have your hope rekindled and it can be lit like a fire again. And it needs to be. You can't just have a, a, a standing in your community of being that, that church that is good, that does good things and stuff. You need to go back to what you heard at first, that Jesus is Lord. And repent from your sins and follow Him and tell everybody you know you need to be alive again. To me, it's terrifying and refreshing at the same time that our Lord would look at us at church and say, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, but you still can't. He says you still can be rekindled. 
that hope can be rekindled, you can still wake up and do the right thing and follow God. The Samaritan woman got that. She got rekindled. She went back and told her whole church. You say, well, she didn't tell her whole church. She told her community. Is your church just this place? Is it just this several thousand square feet that's located at 616 C Street? Or is your church, your house, and your community, and your neighborhood, and your workplace, and wherever you touch base with people? That's your church. That's your mission field. That's where you need to go out and share, just like this woman did. If you're, if you're in the boat with her and your hope is hanging on by a thread, but it's been rekindled this morning, then go out and share it with people so that theirs can be rekindled also. A really interesting thing happens next in this story. And there's a great truth for us to remember and catch is this. Hope combined with action can blossom into faith. I'll say that again. Because I thought about this a lot if I wanted to make this statement. And then I spent some time praying about it and I said, yes, I, I do. I believe that, that God would confirm this. That hope combined with action can blossom into faith. Let's look at verses 41 and 42 again to see exactly what I'm referring to when I say that. Verse 41 and 42 say this. Am I in the right spot? Yep. Long enough for many more to hear. The, uh, am I in the right spot? I'm not in the right spot. Okay. Long enough for many more to hear this message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you have told us, but because we have heard him ourselves, now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. This is not a light statement to be made at all. This is not like, a, oh, you're right. Thanks a lot. We sure appreciate you giving this information. This is a, I've come and seen, now I need to go and tell type of thing. This is a deal where she heard her faith got rekindled. She went out and took action and said, I'm going to share with all these people. And the people said, Jesus, will you stay here with us for a couple days? And after he stayed and keep explaining who he was and what he was doing, they realized it. And then they said, wow, we believe. We heard it ourselves. We know that he's the Savior of the world. And they have faith in Jesus Christ at this point. Because they took action to find out what was going on. They heard something from someone else. And they went and investigated. They took action to see what this was all about. They went and saw Jesus himself. Then they asked him to stay with them. And then they learned. And then it turns into faith. You may not be able to invite Jesus to come into your house and stay for a couple days. But the manual he left with us can sit there all the time. Opened. Read daily. And understood. We can take action ourselves that will grow our faith and make this hope more than just hope, but allow it to blossom into faith. And if we share it with others, they can experience the same thing. If we're willing to go out and share a little bit of our story, just like the Samaritan woman shared with her village, and people's interest and curiosity is piqued, and they investigate, or we help them investigate by giving them a Bible, or showing them different passages, or inviting them to church, or showing them a YouTube video of a sermon, or, or you name it. There's all kinds of different ways that we can put this hope into action to help other people grow into faith. But it all comes down to the same thing that those people declared. Now we know that He is indeed the Savior of the world. See, our hope and faith is in Jesus. Our hope and faith is in Jesus Christ. There's a reason we celebrate the Christmas season is because Jesus Christ came here for us to forgive us of our sins, to live a life that was perfect and then die on that cross to pay the price for our sins. When he was here, he tried to share that with the disciples and let them know that he wasn't just asking them to follow him for no reason, that there was something so much more than what we are living in right now. And at one point in John chapter 14, he tries to explain it to them. John chapter 14, one, verses 1 through 4 says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. 
and you know the way where I am going. Jesus told the disciples in that very moment, here's a scoop. It's not just about this rock that we're floating on called earth. It's not just about these mere moments we get to share together on life. This is about eternal perspective. In other words, when you die and pass away here, you will go one of two places. If you have followed me and asked for the forgiveness of your sins and asked me to be the Lord of your life, then you're going to go to my dad's house. And it is something else. It's a mansion like you can't believe with rooms for everyone inside. And some of you are out there going, I don't know if there's a big enough house that could fit me and all my friends. And I'm not sure if they'd let me in the door. You need to read this book to find out that it is absolutely true. That if you have called upon the name of Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and come into your life, then you, just like a group of people in a Samaritan village, can clearly define that and say, we now know that He is indeed the Savior of the world. And that includes us. See, this is a story about hope. And really interesting, we don't celebrate it in our church tradition, but like in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they really celebrate this woman at the well. They've even given her a name. Her name is Fotina. I don't know if they have some sort of background or how they get that. But she is credited with as many salvations as any one of the apostles. That's a lot. Because Peter went and started the church along with John and all the other disciples. And then Paul came and brought it to the Gentile world. And yet... This woman is credited with bringing salvation to her area because she went out and told everyone she knew. But when the story starts, the hope's not there. There's no hope to have even a relationship with a Jewish man, even a talking one. There's no hope to share worship with him because they worship in different spots and do it differently. There's no hope for any kind of relationship at all, but there's a, there's a shoestring of hope left that this Messiah will come. And when he's right there in front of her, all of a sudden her hope is rekindled. And she goes and takes action on that and tells everyone in her village what she's seen and heard. And then their faith blossoms. Where are we on the hope spectrum this morning? It's a we thing. It's not a how about you peoples. It's a we peoples thing. Are we sitting there going, I just don't feel like there's any hope left in my life for anything. We need to read this story and identify with this woman. Maybe your hope in your life is just, uh, just a little bit. It's just a little bit left there of hope. And you're just like, I have a little bit of hope for something. Understand that that something is right in front of you and his words are right in front of you. And all around you in this world are crosses to help us remind ourselves of what he did for us. Maybe you're in that rekindling phase where all of a sudden you realize who Jesus is. He's right in front of you in your life. And you're hearing Him for the first time and understanding that He is the Messiah. Or maybe it's, it's, it's a refreshing. You knew that before, but all of a sudden it's coming new and real again to you. Then take action and go out and tell other people so that they can share in the same hope we have of a life eternal in that great, beautiful mansion that His Father has built for us. It's Advent season. Today we talk about hope. If Jesus didn't come into this world as a baby on that day in that manger, we would have no hope for an eternity. Share that story with someone this week. Share that story of why maybe you wear that crazy reindeer ears on at work. And they say, what are you doing? You can say, I'm excited about Christmas. Or maybe why you're wearing red and green all of a sudden. You never wear green because it doesn't look good on you. I don't care what this story is. Find a reason to tell somebody about Jesus this week and the hope that we have in Him. And the next few weeks, we'll be talking about peace, love, and joy. All those things that Jesus gives us when we come into relationship with Him. Let's go out as a church and share that with people and grow deeper in our walk with Him. Lord, will you bless us as we go out this morning? Will you inspire us this week to go out and share with people that as we look outside and we see a dark and dreary world, both truly physically right now, Lord, with all the storms brewing, but also spiritually, will you inspire in us conversations to help others come to find you and find the hope that only you can give, our hope in you, Jesus. Please give us direction and bless us this week as we go forward and share you with others. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.